What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD in Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Thanks for tuning in to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today we have um, UK clinical psychologist and psychiatric survivor Rufus May. Uh, Rufus was labeled with schizophrenia, but he doesn't find that a helpful label, and he doesn't take medication, and we're going to be hearing more about his story. He is also a, a mental health campaigner, and he was recently the subject of a Channel 4 film that reached uh, more than a million people in England, and it's called The Doctor Who Hears Voices about um, Rufus, and you can actually watch that film on uh, YouTube. So thanks a lot for joining us today on Madness Radio, Rufus May. Hi. Nice to be here. Rufus, tell us how you got into the mental health system. I know you had um, what would be called a psychotic episode and an extreme state. How did that start, and what exactly happened? How it started, that's, that's a difficult one. It's like, uh, I guess from in my teenage years, I wasn't that happy. Um, uh, there had been some illness in my family. My mom had been quite ill when I was 11, and... Um, I think that had a big impact on me. She had a brain hemorrhage and she was physically and mentally uh, disabled by that. Um, But she did make a very good recovery, but but there were lots of, there was quite a lot of fallout from her illness and her disability uh, in terms of my relationship with her. And and I think I wasn't that happy at school either. Um, But I I kind of muddled along uh, um, and... uh, got involved in quite a lot of rebellious teenage activity, um, smoking cannabis and um, other substances occasionally, um, and, and avoiding schoolwork. So I went from being quite a bright child um, before the age of 11 to slowly sort of becoming quite disaffected with the school system and um, rebelling a bit. And then uh, I tried to pull my life together a bit in uh, when I was about 17. I managed to get a girlfriend. I tried to get my art portfolio together and tried to get a job as a um, an office junior. Um, I tried to clean up my act a bit, and things seemed to be going quite well. And then my girlfriend left me, and um, and I didn't get into uh, any art or advertising jobs. And I managed to get a job, but it was in a very boring job. I thought it would use my artistic skills. Um, it was working as a trainee draftsman, um, but it actually didn't mean uh, using my artistic skills, really. It meant sort of copying um, very boring plans of industrial units. And um, and I had a lot of time on my hands in the office. And I, I started to, I've always had an ability to daydream and I just started to gaze out the window and sort of think about different possibilities and there, were, there, was, some, there was a garage below, people working on cars. And I started to think, well, what if, uh, started to make up stories about them, really. Um, and one day I saw them um, knife throwing, they were throwing a knife against the board and then I thought, oh, that's a bit strange. And so I think maybe they're not really garage attendants. Maybe they're um, working for some secret service organization. And then I started to think about my own job, but maybe that I wasn't really um, a an office junior, but I was actually an apprentice spy, and I had to read all the signs, uh, read between the lines, so to speak. And um, when I was sent to deliver packages, they're actually top secret packages, and um, and I. The more I thought about these ideas, I got quite excited about them, and made me feel special. And um, the more I looked for evidence to support these ideas, the more the more I found them really. And and um, I can remember travelling on the train, um, carrying a package, um, and thinking I was being spied upon by others. 
and having to uh, I, I'd lost my ticket and I thought it must be a, it must be a way to um, test out my ability to deliver a parcel in a diff- difficult circumstances. So everything that happened became explained by this kind of spy espionage scenario. So I spent the whole train journey avoiding the ticket collector and disguising myself um, by using water to make my hair look different. So this kind of started as just uh, daydreaming and fantasizing. And it sounds like you were under a lot of, of stress at the same time with all these changes, losing your girlfriend and working in a job that you didn't like that much. Do you, do you think that those kinds of factors sort of played a big role in... Oh, massively, yeah. I was um, I was just 18. There was a huge pressure. It, that's very symbolic age. You know, I felt like I suddenly had to become an adult and, and know who I was. And I think there was a lot of pressure on me around that. And a lot of my friends or former friends, my girlfriend's friends were going off to university and I felt really isolated. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I think the loss of my girlfriend had hit me much more than I'd realized, actually. And I think, looking back, that it sort of triggered a grief response that, that was about what happened to my mother when I was 11. But I didn't think of that at the time. But looking back, I think that sort of explains why I had this huge reaction. Uh, but instead of getting depressed, like some people might get depressed, I kind of escaped into this, this fantasy world, this dream-like reality, really. So you um, were having this huge emotional response, but you were just really not in touch with it at all. That's and right. instead, you started to just sort of fantasize. And at what point did this imagination, because a lot of us daydream, but at what point did this sort of fantasy that you had really start taking on a life of its own and really start to be out of control, do you think? You know, the more I got into it, really, so I, I started to think maybe animals were robots. Um, a lot of my ideas were taken from science fiction books that I'd read when I was younger. Um, but even that, I think, is meaningful, I think, you know, on, on lots of levels. So now, looking back, I could see lots of meaning. So when I went to see my mother when she was 11, she, she had her head shaved, she had pipes coming out of her, so she looked a bit like a robot. So maybe some of my ideas about people being robots was linked to that experience, for example. Sounds um, like that was very traumatic for an 11-year-old to just sort of be dealing with your, your mother in that difficult condition with the sickness. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. And, um, yeah, she, she was never the same. She did make a really good recovery, and I think that's what helped my recovery. But, um, but at the same time, that experience um, did, did traumatize me, I think, and, and I don't think I adapted to it or got the support, perhaps, that I could have done um, to, to adapt him to that situation. Could you feel yourself sort of reaching the point of no return and starting to be just kind of swept away by this fantasy world? And did, were you start to hear voices or were you seeing things visually that weren't there or was it more of a mental thing? It just got very exciting, you know, to believe you're a spy, could be a spy. And I was also experimenting with ideas about spirituality as well. I felt very tuned into the, the doom and gloom in the world and uh, for, I had a sense of foreboding and I was doing a lot of praying. And, but I, I, I started to get messages coming back to me from God or via um, advertising hoardings. And, but the more I looked for those messages, the more they came more and more so and the, the more excited I got the less I slept the more intense these experiences were so the TV and radio started uh, reflecting my thoughts it seemed but but I could see how I got into this because um, my uncle's a, a, a reverend and he, he he used to tell me when he was a kid that if he wanted to um, get some advice from God, he'd pray, and then he'd wait for an answer, and sometimes he'd see the answer on advertising hoardings. <laughs> so, um, so in a way, what I was doing was just a very intense <laughs> uh, version of what he was doing, but without the support of a religious community. <laughs> and um, um, it was a very much solo act, really. And, and yeah, I, d- I did get swept away. The more I 
more I didn't sleep, the more intense these experiences became. So you and, just sort um, of stopped sleeping at some point, and that can really, I, I know from so many people, sleep deprivation can really drive you right into psychosis or, or some kind of madness state. That's, that's right, that's right. Looking back, were some of the spiritual things that you were observing, the, the signs in advertising and the answers from God, do you think that there's meaning and validity in that as well? Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> I said before that I'd kind of rebelled as a teenager, and I hadn't, I'd, I'd, I'd tried to be in some ways a little bit of a gangster. It didn't really suit me, but I think I had a lot of guilt about some of the ways I behaved as a teenager, you know, petty crime and, and letting friends down and trying to be a bit of um, a con man, just on a very small scale. But, but I think I carried a lot of guilt, but, but it wasn't really me. And I do think that, that a lot of the stuff coming up was about guilt and about... All, all I can say is that, that after those psychotic experiences, I felt a lot freer. It was like something was released from me. Um, and well, I'm fast forwarding now about a year later, but I felt, um, like I'd moved on, like something had been released from inside me and I was no longer inhibited. I think before that I was quite shackled with a lot of shame and guilt and somehow all these experiences coming up and, and me acting quite wildly. I mean, at times like I would, I, I, I would be quite impulsive. So I remember my parents having friends around. And these were friends who'd been, um, they had a son a similar age as, as me. And there'd always been a bit of rivalry between the two families. And in my kind of psychotic state, I, I saw that as really uh, petty and um, un, unhelpful. So I thought I'd completely rebel against it. So I kind of, I just stripped off <laughs> naked and just sort of walked into the room and said, hi, everyone. <laughs> and... <laughs> and um, and although those things got me into a lot of trouble and, you know, eventually got me detained in hospital. How long, I did, think, it, how long did it last that you were in this kind of wild state? Because it sounds like it was, there was a lot of positive things going on for you, but it, it sounds like it, it kind of led to some big problems with, uh, <laughs> with getting in trouble with the mental health system. Yeah, I mean, I was hospitalized fairly quickly. Within about six weeks, there was a family history. My grandfather had had psychotic experiences and um, been diagnosed with schizophrenia and so had my auntie. So they were very quick to say, oh, this is schizophrenia and you'll have to take medication for the rest of your life and it's just a brain disease. And um, Were they the ones that brought you to the hospital when they decided? My parents, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was was there was there something that was the last straw? Was it was it walking into the room naked with your friend there? What was it that kind of kind of was the moment in which they? No, actually, it was me. I was um, I was concerned because I'd started getting chest pains, uh, which I now think was stress related, but at the time I thought it was a gadget inside my chest. Uh, so I was getting these chest pains, and. I felt like I was under surveillance because I was a spy um, and I'd, I'd picked up evidence of this. Um, and, and, and so I, I believed that maybe I had some kind of surveillance gadget actually inside me and that it could also be used to not only monitor me but punish me if I was stepping out of line. So I, I, I had developed this whole theory that I had this foreign object inside me that was could be used to control me so i asked to go to my gp and and so not a specialist but family doctor yeah we went to see our family doctor and i told her about what was going on and she looked very concerned and said you need to see a specialist and i thought i was going to see a chest specialist <laughs> but uh i was taken to see a psychiatrist do you think maybe the stress from not sleeping might have contributed to the to the chest pain yeah the, and the anxiety because Although the ideas were exciting and um, quite glamorous at the beginning, they they took on they also took on this slightly frightening side. Once I started thinking I was under surveillance, um, so I think I think yeah, a combination of sleep deprivation and anxiety. 
Did you have oh. any sense that what you were going through was different than your ordinary personality or were you pretty much totally convinced that you were just inside of it and it was real? I was very convinced. Um, yeah, yeah. And and the more, and also nobody suggested any alternative to me. Everybody, when, you, when you're crazy like that, in a way, you're in an altered state, other people, it brings out their craziness as well because people don't, people are frightened they see you behaving in a weird way and they behave in a weird way so that didn't that didn't help what was an um, example of that do you mean your your parents <laughs> judging you or what was how were I, people? I suppose so um yeah i went to stay with some friends and and um i thought it'd be a bit of a sanctuary i knew i was kind of exhausted and i knew i needed um rest and uh so i went to stay with some friends of the family and um and they actually tried some religious healing on me, but without asking my permission. So that was weird. <laughs> there was some ritual going on in the next room, and I, I'm, I'm convinced of this now. I don't think it's It's not delusional. It actually happened. No, no. But it probably yeah, yeah. didn't help your paranoid state to have this ritual going on in the next room without them telling you about it. That's right. But I'm not, I don't blame them. I just think people get a bit desperate. A bit. It brings out people's own craziness in, in a way. Because people have... Yeah, they're, they're trying to help, but, but sometimes in more extreme ways. You see it in psychiatric wards all the time, you know, staff pinning people down when they don't need to. They could just try and talk someone down. But because I, I guess we need to sort of almost train people to be comfortable when other people are in uh, distressed or high, very high and unpredictable states. Definitely. The, the best thing you can do is to sort of stay calm and be very level and grounded with people but that that's a skill that most psychiatric staff don't don't have actually or aren't aren't encouraged to have there's more an emphasis on containing people rather than calming being calming with them stabilizing them controlling them um rufus when you were brought to the um the gp for the what you thought was for the chest pains they actually referred you to the psychiatrist what happened then? Were you interviewed by, by the psychiatrist? Were you just taken by force to the hospital, or, or how did that go? I had a couple of different interviews. One hospital was full. They took me to another hospital, and, and they admitted me and told me I couldn't leave. And um, I suddenly found myself in this hospital ward, and it really reminded me of the hospital ward my mum had been on, which was a neuro rehabilitation ward for people with brain injuries. But there were a lot of similarities. Um, in, in the atmosphere and, and um, the sort of levels of impulsivity of the, the patients and stuff. So I kind of, uh, it felt quite familiar in a strange way. And I felt like I'd seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And I felt like Jack Nicholson in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I just started walking around, talking to all the patients and, and trying to uh, uh, try to be cheerful about where I was. And try, at the same time, trying to work out where I was. Mm, what is this place? I know what it is. It's a it's a place for burnt out spies. That was my first theory. Um, that it was just pretending to be a hospital, but really everyone was a spy like me. It it took quite a few weeks for me to drop that theory because I just th thought in the end actually people don't seem to be uh, recuperating. <laughs> what uh, happened to you in the hospital? Were you given medications? Did they do testing on you? Did you do group therapy or or the inpatient? admissions that I had were very much just medication. Um, there was a program of activities on the wall, but they didn't happen. Um, so it was all about just being given quite strong medication. And in those days, they felt the medication was working when you were kind of riddled with side effects. <laughs> so, um, you know, tremoring, shuffling, drooling um i had lo i had lots of side effects and i was like this stuff is you know poison to me because the levels i was being given at it just didn't feel at all therapeutic it just felt unpleasant <clears throat> and i think i was quite sensitive to it i was quite young i was although i was 18 physically i was quite a young 18 i looked about 14 and i think the medication had quite a strong effect on me so um what uh, well, medication did they give you? Some kind of antipsychotic like tranquilizer? Like chlorpromazine type neuroleptic medication, really. Modicate was the first one. Uh, uh, pimazide, 
he might have different names in the states, but um, yeah, very strong, strong with Parkinsonian type side effects. And um, you had never been suicidal or been threatening or dangerous to anybody. They just looked at you and just said, "This guy is is crazy. We're going to put him on medication." Yeah, you know, I was talking about being a spy, and you know, I was when I was nervous, my speech was uh, faltering, and um, so they, they they kind of ticked all the boxes. Thought this fits the, the category of schizophrenia. We need to give him these schizophrenia drugs. But yeah, for me, I wanted someone to talk to and uh, to, to listen to me and to exchange ideas about what was going on. But, but that didn't happen. It was seen as a bad thing to do. It, it was all about if, if I talked to a nurse about what, was, what I was thinking about, they would change the subject and try and get me to play Scrabble or chess or something. So here, here you were going through this powerful, overwhelming experience, and you're put into an environment where everyone around you is instructed to not talk with you about it. That's right. And um, and a lot of people were very institutionalized in there as well. So it was quite a depressing environment. You know, I, Everybody I think, else was pretty over-medicated as well and having the side effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there were people with all kinds of disabilities in there. I think there were people there with kind of learning disabilities as well. And People have been. You know, one guy, I remember him just banging his head against the wall. And it was, it was an inner city psychiatric ward. It w- was very poorly resourced, and um, but they did have a good day hospital. Once you'd been discharged from the from the inpatient unit, you could go to. That was quite good. It had quite a lot of therapeutic activity, so it wasn't all completely the hospital from hell. But it did feel like the hospital from hell when I was <laughs> an inpatient. And, how long um, were you there, and how did you get well, out? Well, I, I had I had three different admissions, but they were each a month long. And I was very l- lucky in a way that my parents saw how un- unhappy I was. And I kept whenever they came to see me, I think you've got to get me out of here. I kind of instinctively um, knew that it wasn't a good place for me to be in. That, that I could feel myself picking up on the behaviours of the other patients. So I remembered, like, to make myself seem more dangerous than than other people there to protect myself because there were people from prison and I felt quite scared um, I, I developed quite a mad laugh to, to make me seem more menacing than I was um, but of course that, that protects me in the hospital but it wasn't very good for my um, it wasn't very good for getting babysitting or you know, getting jobs or um, meeting friends you know, having a mad laugh that, 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 that made you sound scary. So, so the skills I was learning to survive in the hospital weren't good for, for being at home. So, but the, the the good thing that happened, I mean, the first admission, I as soon as I came out, I stopped taking the medication, and that gave me a kind of um, I got very high because I came off the medication too quickly, and, um, and my parents found out and said, "You need to be back in the hospital. You're not taking the medication." So we went back to the hospital. And during the second admission, um, I met two people. Uh, one was a really good friend of mine who I already knew. She started coming to visit me every every day. She'd been away up till then, but she came back from Germany and started visiting me. And that was a, a marvelous thing. And also there was a there was a new guy on the ward who who'd um, come from a secure hospital, but he was he was very together and he was he was very good at um being happy in 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 the hospital system and he was a real shining light to me about how you could be hopeful and how you could be um how you could have fun in quite an oppressive um place so uh he, he was a real role model paul and then my friend Catherine, she she was a godsend too so these two people i think um gave me real hope and and I started to sort of plan my recovery really from about then um, and, and and tried to start um, going to drama classes so I'd sneak off the ward and try and go places because I felt I needed to, to try and learn to express myself. Um, I think I was very lucky that I'd witnessed my own mother's recovery when I was 11, 12, 13 
and she saw how important it was to to be really determined to recover, but also how you needed other people in that process. So when my mother had been ill when I was 11, she had, um, what my dad had done was got a whole uh, network of people around her, different friends coming around each day doing physiotherapy exercises with her. Um, so she, she, uh, she had this whole community of people around her helping her um, both learn physical exercises, learn to walk again, but also learning to talk again and different social skills. You learn from different social contacts. So with it, with all these different people coming around, the circle of friends around her, she, I saw how that really helped her. And I think I had that blueprint in my own mind once I started realizing that I was, um, that I, I needed to learn to communicate again and needed to learn um, ways to stay out of the psychiatric system. Um, After you got out of the hospital, you made your own decision to come off medications. It was um, you didn't have any kind of support, and it was against what the doctors were recommending. Yeah, it was just instinctive, really. That, that it was making me. I mean, it was stopping me from being able to um, sexually perform or have a sex life, and that was very important to an 18-year-old. Uh, young man and um, you know I just found my masculinity and it had been taken away from me <laughs> uh, so um, but I but I did end up back on medication a couple of times and uh, in the end I was put on a because I was sort of seen as non-compliant I suppose I was given a, met, a, a, a depo injection a fortnightly injection and I was on that for six months that must have been horrible yeah yeah I mean it was it was better than the first lot of medication I was on, but but it, um, that was the only. It was horrible that it was kind of t that choice was taken away from me. Um, because the depo injection is they give you one shot and it's such a giant dose that it lasts for an entire month. So that the side the side effects must have been really strong from that. Yeah, yeah. So I was very emotionally blunted. You know, I was very kind of wooden. Um, and um, but I was still there's still this kind of motor going inside me um, that I uh, um, so I managed to get myself into art college and um, I think for me you see I think because I, I work with people now trying to help people and, and stuff and I think that rebelliousness that I'd had as a teenager actually was really useful in the psychiatric system you know. Uh, I had this real sense that when people told me you can't do something, right, I'm going to do it. So when they said you can't go to college, I thought, right, I'm going to do it. Or you can't work. I went out and got a job, you know. And and so um, I think um, I think we need to teach children that rebelliousness, you know, how to how to find your own sense of authority and not not always believe authority, you know. Sometimes authority is right, but we, we need to kind of listen in to our own sense. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health. We are speaking with Rufus May, who is a UK psychiatric survivor who's been labeled with schizophrenia, but doesn't find that label helpful and has found alternative ways of dealing with his mental health. And he also was recently involved with the Channel 4 film that you can watch on YouTube, uh, called The Doctor Who Hears Voices. Rufus is also a mental health campaigner and works as a clinical psychologist. When you came off of the medication after you were in the hospital, how did you sort of make the journey to becoming a campaigner and an activist and eventually going to school yourself and becoming a clinical psychologist? I was really helped, you know, by, by friends and um, by also spiritual community. Um, so I, I, I went to churches and things like that. Something happened so during the time I was kind of getting my life back together. So um, I, I managed to leave home, and um, that was quite important, I think, for both my parents and me. Um, that gave. Uh, that, I think I was very stressful to be around for them. They worried a lot about me, and when I managed to leave home and live with friends. That was that was much more sort of uh, empowering environment for me. I was able to take on more responsibilities, 
um, but around this time when I was getting my life together, a fellow patient killed herself and I went to her funeral and I, there were hundreds of people at her funeral and I was really um, disgusted in a way or, or outraged that I'd, I'd been a patient with her in hospital and she'd hardly ever had a visitor and that there where I was at the funeral and there were these hundreds of people and I just suddenly felt like I've got to do something about this. This is, this is not just a few ignorant doctors and um you know this is a whole this is our whole society you know really neglecting people and and giving up on people and it gave me a quest you know it gave me a a, um a mission um i thought maybe i can do something about this if i can actually get to a position where i can tell people about what's really going on in the psychiatric system then then uh you know, maybe people will really listen to me and, and, and wake up, you know, that we need to do things differently. It, that just drugging people is not good enough and, and, and just diagnosing people and not thinking about what's going, really going on for that person. So this, this friend of mine who, who took her own life, I'm sure she was hearing voices. I'm sure she had some really terrifying experiences. Well, all they did was just keep increasing the dose of medication. It made her put on weight. It made her shake. But it wasn't addressing her real problems, you know, and and it was it was just demoralising her further. So I just felt we've got to do things differently. So I so um, I planned to study as a psychologist. Um, the, one of the one of the most um, open-minded people I'd met in in the psychiatric system as a worker was a was a was a junior psychologist, an assistant psychologist, and uh, and he questioned my diagnosis. He says, "I don't think she's got schizophrenia, and I think it was drug-induced psychosis." But just that was very helpful to me. Um, I mean, I, uh, just the idea that this was a temporary thing rather than a lifelong thing um, was really helpful. Uh, and I thought, "Oh, a psychologist, somebody who's prepared to listen, somebody who's." Um, thinking a bit outside the box who's, who's not just going to um, go along with the psychiatrist, with the doctor. That, that's, that's interesting. And that, so I looked into studying psychology. Um, and um, so the idea was to, to train as a psychologist, which I then did over the next sort of 10 years. I had to get relevant experience. And I did a degree, then I did a doctorate. And each time I got to different stages of my training, I thought, shall I tell people about my experiences as a psychiatric patient? Because I think they're really useful in my recovery. And, 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 um, and then <clears throat> something always said to me, no, maybe you shouldn't, just in case people then sort of uh, judge you or d discriminate against you, it counts against you. So I decided, because no one else was talking about their experiences, of distress or confusion on on any of the psychology courses, which is a bit strange, really. You think psychology would be very a good place to talk about um, experiences of distress and, and and recovery, but actually it doesn't happen very often. Um, so so because of that atmosphere, I just decided to keep quiet about it. And it wasn't until I'd qualified as a clinical psychologist, you know, some. 12 years after my actual psychiatric admissions uh, that I decided to tell people um, what, what I'd gone through. So I waited till I was in a power position where I'd proved myself as a competent practitioner. And then, I said, then it was a case of, oh, by the way, um, I, I've had these experiences and I was given this label. And it was really unhelpful to be given a label of schizophrenia. So once so I guess um, my idea was to be a bit of a kind of wooden horse to go into the psychiatric system and, and expose it from within, really. Um, once I, and people started to listen to me um, because I had the qualification of a psychologist. And you've been doing, since um, getting your degree, and you've been doing such amazing work as an activist and an educator, you do a lot of writing, you're involved in a lot of community organizing one yeah. of the things that you've done recently is um this film that was on channel four in the uk called the doctor who hears voices 
and I guess more than a million people watched it. Tell us about that film and what, what, what it's all about and what the reaction has been. Um, well, there's a filmmaker called Leo Regan. Um, he won a BAFTA, which is um, sort of TV Oscars <laughs> um, over here um, and uh, for, for another film that he made. And, and he spent about a year, year and a half following me and my work. And he followed me in my work in hospitals in the National Health Service, but he also followed me in my more independent work with self-help groups and and um, conferences and things like that. And he ended up focusing on one particular person who was a junior doctor who started to hear voices. Um, she, what had happened was she'd um, been suspended from her job because of depression, suicidal ideas, and, and the shock of losing her career uh, made her start hearing a voice and then she was in a real dilemma because if she told her doctors that she was hearing a voice she'd definitely lose her career as a doctor um, so um, she turned to me for support and I decided to support her to learn to cope with the experience of voice hearing and to also support her in keeping quiet about it um, to her employers so that she could get back working as a doctor. I thought when I met her and I, work, I, I, I met her a few times, I realized she was a very committed person. Um, and um, it seemed quite unfair, the suspension. I knew if I could get her back to work, that would be um, a big part of her recovery. That would be sort of half to three quarters of her recovery if I could get her back to work. So um, the film followed me working with her and working with her voice hearing experience and, 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 and showing that voice hearing and paranoia are meaningful experiences. They are not just crazy um, experiences that are fueled by m misfiring brain uh, parts or neurons. You know. How um, did you work with her and what kinds of voices was she hearing and, and what is it that you did that was helpful? Well, she, she had a very aggressive voice telling her to kill herself. Um, firstly, it's about um, normalizing the experience, um, telling her about other people's voice hearing experience, how common it is, um, how you can, you don't have to do what a voice tells you to do, uh, how you can resist um, the voice, not only what it tells you to do, but also resist the kind of things it tells you about yourself. So the voice is insulting her. So how can you resist that and start to um, feel good about yourself so that if, if a voice criticizes you, you you're more um, resilient. So um, we worked on relaxation exercises, physical exercises to express um, emotion and, and, and get rid of stress. Um, so the idea that voices often feed off repressed emotions. So we did a lot of kind of emotional resilience work and um, later on it was about looking at who the voice represented you know what what kind of conflicts what had happened in her life and um, you know who did the usually voices represent bullying kind of difficult voices not all voices are difficult but they represent bullying relationships of some kind or oppressive relationships so did some work on that and and some healing work around that. So that can be, you know, it's it's not a quick fix. It's an ongoing therapeutic venture, really. Um, but also self-help groups were very helpful to the, the real Ruth. That gives you a flavor, I think, of some of the things we did. Could you trace some of her, you, you mentioned bullying and difficult experiences. Could you trace some of her voices to trauma that she had in the yeah. past? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was a bully from her teenage years who was very... You know, aggressive and on an ongoing basis towards her. And um, But it took her a long time to recognize the connection. She just felt like there was this voice and it didn't really come from anywhere in her own experience. It was just from the outside. That's right. Because in a way, part of her mind didn't want to think about the previous experience of bullying. We had to get to a good place in our relationship before she was willing to talk about that with me and make those links. But then bringing that into the open, like it's when you, uh, it's like any bullying experience, when you bring it out into the open, get support for it, it becomes more manageable. 
as well. Now, Rufus, a lot of the ideas that you're talking about are used in the hearing voices movement in the, right. in the UK. And we don't really have that. We don't have hearing voices groups. I mean, there's a couple. There's one in Madison, Wisconsin, and there's one that the Freedom Center that I'm involved with does in um, Western Massachusetts. But tell us just a little bit about this this bigger movement and the philosophy that you've been involved with in helping people who hear voices? Um, there's some work done by a uh, Dutch psychiatrist, Marius Rom, and his wife and fellow researcher, Sandra Escher. It's One of their books is called Accepting Voices. So it's, it's a very different approach to voice hearing to traditional psychiatry, which might try and get rid of voices with medication. But 40 to 50% of people um, medication doesn't really affect voices um, in a meaningful way and uh, they were interested in setting up resources to help people who continue to hear voices and they're suggesting that you need, we need to learn to live with the experience if one is hearing voices we need to learn to live with it and understand it um, change your relationship to the experience so hearing voices in itself is not a problem in many cultures it's a very acceptable experience and in a way, the hearing voices movement is trying to reintroduce that to the West, that hearing voices in itself is not a problem. It's, if you feel oppressed by that experience, then it's a problem and you need to talk about the experience and learn ways to stand up to your voices um, and relocate them, really, um, so that you're um, in a stronger position. So we see voices as often messengers about... Um, injustices people have experienced in the past. So there's a lot of research showing that people who hear voices have had um, trauma in the past and um, voices are often talking about that. So, so the, hear, um, the hearing voices movement is very much about how can we come together um, and share, share experiences of voice hearing, share experiences of um, I, I, I don't actually hear voices, but I've been very impressed with the hearing voices movement as an alternative approach to to um, you know, psychotic experience. I mean, I had, when I was um, going through my episode, I, I heard voices from the TV and radio, but I didn't hear disembodied voices like um, independently of that. Um, but I've been, I've been working with hearing voices self-help groups facilitating those for about seven years now and I've learned a lot about how to help people change their relationship with the voices so that people find they can be assertive but also sometimes compassionate towards their voices. The voices start to change. So um, it, it, it's a very exciting approach really um, that, that, that's not about getting rid of voices uh, and I think we can apply it to other mental health problems as well like depression or uh, mood swings or paranoia. Um, it's not about eradicating these experiences and being all normal. It's about learning to live with these experiences and and grow through them, so that we we're not we're not a victim of these experiences, but we actually can learn from them. So even even a destructive voice can be uh, uh, something we can learn from. It might it, it's obviously representing something we need to get over in our lives. If we've got a very aggressive voice attacking us, if I've got an aggressive voice calling me skinny wretch or something, skinny idiot, then it probably means I need to do some self-esteem building and, uh, you know, or maybe have a, get a t-shirt that says skinny and proud or something, you know, or it, it, it represents stuff, it's meaningful, so so we can, with support, we can we can turn these things from, from very difficult experiences into things that can uh, help us grow. And this approach is, is getting more and more successful in the UK. Yeah, there's about 200 groups in the UK uh, and self-help groups, and we're developing techniques. Um, I've done quite a lot of work with a Dutch psychiatrist called Dirk Kirstens, where we, we've done a lot of um, work learning speak with people's voices which may sound strange but that can sometimes be helpful for people uh one of the scary things about voice hearing is that you're all alone with it uh nobody else knows what you're going through but you can use chairs it's actually a sort of an, ad an adaptation of an american method called voice dialogue you can use chairs you create a chair for the for the voice and ask the person to sit in the, the voices chair and they can tell you what the voice is saying. We've got some information. There's some information about those kind of approaches on my website. 
uh, rufusmay.com. But yeah, so some exciting techniques that really kind of bring the experience out into the open so we can start to help the person make peace with the experience. Rufus, are there any dangers to the hearing voices approach? Because I know a lot of psychiatrists, as you mentioned, just believe that you just cannot talk about any of this stuff. You have to just suppress it. Yeah, I mean, what makes what makes an approach safe, I guess, is that it's always based on trust, on the person choosing to try something out, trusting their own wisdom. So I, I think a lot of the approaches that we use are always grounded in the idea that the person we're working with has expertise and wisdom about what's going to be helpful to them. So we're always checking that out. Is this helpful? If not, we'll drop it. Try this instead. You know, try this breathing technique. It's all about choice, really, and, and creating an atmosphere a relationship based on trust, mutual respect, and, 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 and honesty. I think dangers are when we, we leap in with, with, with interventions and, and don't build that trust. And, and, uh, and I think there's also a danger where other people panic about what you're doing. So a lot of the Hearing Voices movement's emphasis is on educating professionals, public. So that's one of the reasons I agreed to make the film. The film has been a bit controversial, but what it's got people... Because it, because it, the, the way the film's been made, it was, it was made to get people to watch it. So it's kind of focused. It has focused on risk and, and, and questioned whether my approach is quite risky. But what it's got people to do is to talk about these experiences and, 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 and to think that's what we need people doing, really. We need the public to do is to, is to realize that this is not a taboo experience. You know, madness or voice hearing are not taboo experiences that we, we, we should only leave to professionals to talk about. We, we all need to, we've all got wisdom about what helps healing. The Hearing Voices Movement is very good on, on sort of education, training people about how common the experience is, what are the coping strategies, how they link to trauma. There's a real community development approach, uh, not just a therapeutic approach. Rufus, we are just about out of time. Um, give us the uh, contact information if people want to find out more about your work, uh, get in touch with you. Um, how can they do that? Okay, well, it's all on my website, really, um, www.rufusmay.com. That's R-U-F-U-S-M-A-Y.com. There's a link to the YouTube series. There's seven short YouTube films that you can watch. Um, so people can watch the entire film. They can watch the entire film, yep, uh, from beginning to end. And, you know, it's already getting quite good feedback. People saying it's uh, been really moving and helpful and help them connect. Yeah, and the website has got lots of good links. There's a very good intervoice is another good website, but you can get to that through my website around um, voice hearing. That's got lots of resources around self-help for voice hearing and um, research. Um, we, there's another med there's another website that I've helped set up called comingoff.com that, that, that's got information about reducing medication, which also has a link to the uh, Freedom Center or the Ecos Project self-help material on reducing medication. Um, Rufus May, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. You're very welcome. Good to talk. You've been listening to an interview with Rufus May. Um, Rufus is a clinical psychologist. He's also a psychiatric survivor who was labeled with schizophrenia, but doesn't um, find that that's helpful, and he doesn't take medication. He's a mental health campaigner and activist in um, the UK, and he recently was involved in a Channel 4 film uh, that more than a million people have watched called The Doctor Who Hears Voices, and you can uh, watch that um, film on YouTube. His uh, website is rufusmay.com. That's all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Co-produced by peer-run mental health community freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall. Music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help get us broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.